Journey, Journey Church. Welcome. It's a beautiful Sunday, October 3rd. We're so happy you're joining us this morning. Uh, thank you for dropping us. So right now, right here, is going to be a QR, QR code. code. That QR code is going to be able to be able to be get you connected with those here at church and also connected with everybody right now. When you click on that link, you fill out the information. It's going to also give you a chance to, we're going to send you a mixer gift card for a free cup of coffee or pastry or something there because we want to make sure we are saying we love you. This is a great month to join us here at Journey. Next week, we kick off a whole brand new series called More Like Jesus. Um, I think you'll be starting that message, won't you? Yeah, I'll be preaching next week. Yep. Okay. Also this month on Friday, October the 29th from 5 to 7, Journey will um, be participating in Hopkinsville's uh, Trick or Treat Festivals. We are. We're Instead of trick or treating across the front door, we're going to be passing out bags of cars. So we're going to pass out about 500 bags of cars or 500 bags to people in cars because we want to make sure we are loving on our community uh, because we love living here. We love being a part of Hopkinsville. But what we, what we need from you isn't it's necessarily candy. the work, is we need the candy. We'll also not just have candy, we'll also be passing out treats for pups if you bring yeah. your dogs with you. So that's something new I haven't seen a church do before is passing out dog treats. So uh, yeah, I'm excited about that. I love okay. watch what we do with dogs and things like that. So make sure you are being blessed and being a part of that. So make sure you join us. Uh, make sure you get your candy here. Uh, Friday. Plenty of time to make sure we get those bags filled in time. So also that leads us that up to following Sunday, um, Love Day. Sunday, October 31st is Love Day. We're going to be joining here at the church at 9 a.m. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going out and we're going to be loving on our community. There's going to be several different jobs we're doing across the city. And we want to make sure that we are loving on our community the way Journey Church loves people. Because we are trained to love God, love others. That's what it's about. That's what scripture's about. That's what we're about is loving God and loving others. And we want to make sure we're going to take a whole day out of our month and we're going to go out there and we're going to love on people. I'm so excited about that. Yes. And that morning after our church members have gone out and served, everybody's going to come back here um, and have lunch, a nice chilly lunch with all the fixings. Um, so if you have a chance to come out and go do stuff for Hopkinsville on Love Day and then join us after for lunch. Um, that would be amazing. Yes, so we're excited about that. So thank you guys for being with us. So welcome home. Welcome to Journey Church. The Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Come through the Holy Spirit, Conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection.
I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the next thing I believe. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For spirit of the Lord is there's freedom like I felt that song this morning like I just love worship that's how I connect I connect I just love it and that is so true like where the spirit of the Lord is I mean is the spirit of the Lord in your finance the spirit of the Lord is everywhere like are you bringing him into all the different aspects of your life because that freedom is sweet as it wasn't too long ago, like, well, I didn't have that freedom. You know, when you're in a financial crisis, you don't see tithing as an important thing. But it was something that we made a um, conscious choice to continue doing, even when it was super difficult. And it's just taking that next step. And so bringing the Spirit of the Lord into everything, especially your finances, because it's not necessarily what you can give. While it's important to give to the local body, I mean, that's how you hold it up. It's what it happens inside you. That's the benefit, and that's the reason and to give and to give freely to get to walk in that freedom. So I just want to encourage you in that today because I know sometimes you just call money talk and I don't want to sound like that, but it's for yourself. It's for your spiritual walk and for your own growth to walk in that obedience and just give what God has done and, you know, just give back because of what he is doing for you, let alone the million of other things, like freedom is the main one, like having the freedom to know that you're walking in alignment with what Christ wants for your life. So I just wanted to share that and uh, keep it short and simple, but it's, it's for what will happen on the inside of your heart that is the most important and why we push it, because it's how you can grow and continue that walk and just go deeper. So and go for it, but just do so freely, and do so knowing that when you invite the Spirit of the Lord into those places in your heart, and your life, all aspects, and that being one of the most important, like, He will move on your behalf, like, He's waiting for that, for you to take that step, so I just want to encourage you to take it today, so join me in prayer, please. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this body that you have um, blessed us with. Thank you for the things that are happening here, all the things that we're doing outside of the box to just honor you and to grow and go further in relationship with you. Lay on our hearts what it is that you want us to give of our talents, time, or money, whatever that looks like for each one of us, whatever we need to do more of to grow and get closer to you and to continue this walk, we just thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. And for everyone joining us online, we want to say thank you for being blessed with us to be online right now as we continue our series, The Lies We Believe, with Pastor Vince.
Well, good morning to all of you watching online, those of you here in the building. Now, I shared with us that what we're going to talk about this morning is something, the lie that you should talk about sex in church. That's a lie. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's look at our theme scripture verse that I believe God wants me to help us understand. 3 John chapter 1-4, through 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Walking in the truth. Say that with me. Walking, walking. In, the truth. in the truth. This is different than just listening to truth, but this is actually doing what truth says. And let's just be honest. You and I, we can attend all the Financial Peace University courses that are out there, but if we don't do any of the lessons that we've heard, we will still live in poverty. We will still live with a poverty mindset. Amen. Amen. We can listen to all the scriptures on CD. Uh, we can listen to the Word of God. We can, we can listen to a lot of great podcasts on how to get ahead. But unless we do those things, we're just fooling ourselves. And so this, this verse, there is great joy. And every parent, I believe, is in here has experienced this, that proud moment when your child does what you've taught them. Now, two things I want to lay a foundation on. Number one, as you hear what I say, someone who is human and inadequate, please allow God to speak to you. Okay? How many of you will do that? Amen. Secondly, I'm fully aware of the diversity in this group. I know that there are married people here. I know that there's married people here struggling in their marriage. I know that there are single people here. I know that there are divorced people here. I know that there's young and mature here. I know that there are individuals that, that you're carrying some, some mental weight that you've been struggling with concerning this issue. And so my heart is to bring to you biblical truth and then allow the Holy Spirit to do the rest. That means that when I get up here and speak this morning, there are some things I'm very passionate about and I may say very passionately and I don't want you to feel condemned. Instead, I want you to feel convicted. Do you understand the difference? See, condemnation is the devil pushing guilt on you to keep you where you're at. Conviction is the Holy Spirit tapping on you saying, you can be more like Jesus. So I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Romans chapter 12, verses 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this morning, we want to shift our lifestyle from living the way the world has into living the way God wants us to. Because I personally believe, and this is my belief, I hope you'd make it yours, but here's mine. See, I believe that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful to, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I believe that. And so the purpose of that is to help me as an individual, help you as an individual, to then be fully equipped the way God wants you to do life. Every good work he has planned for you, when you clock in at your job, when you're dating an individual, when you're going out, when you're coming in, that the blessings that we sang this morning, coming in, going out, rising up, laying down, that those blessings are because you are doing what God's word says. Now that belief that I have is found in 2 Timothy 3.16, if you're taking notes. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 18 and 19. There are three things which are too great for me, four which I do not understand. Let's pause right there. Anytime in scripture that they use numbers like this, 
They're saying, hey, there's some really important stuff I want to share with you, and I really want you to pay attention to number four. There's three things that are too great for me to understand, and four which I completely don't understand. Why is that in there? Pay attention to number four. So here they are. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship out in sea, and the way of a man with a woman. And all the men said, <laughs> Now, if I could be completely honest, the, um, the church has done over the years a very poor job when it comes to um, meeting cultural, culture where it's at. Culture twists things, and so churches, we, we typically want to correct those things, and instead we end up beating up people. And so... Um, because our culture has such a twisted view of sex, it seems that the church's message over the years have been like, don't do it. It's bad. Don't talk about it. Don't even think about it. That's our stance. Again, because culture has twisted it. In fact, between the 3rd and 10th century of the church, it issued proclamations to Christians that forbid husbands and wives having sex on Thursdays because that was the day that Jesus was arrested. They also decided, if we're going to make sure people don't have sex on Thursdays, we shouldn't let them have sex on Fridays and Saturdays either because that was his death, burial, and resurrection. And so they put proclamations that Christians, husbands and wives, not to have sex on those days. Don't have sex on Friday because that's when he died. Don't have sex on Sunday because that was his resurrection. Then they started adding more things. Don't have sex during the 40 days of Lent. Don't have sex during the 40 days of Advent. Don't have sex during the 40 days of Pentecost. In fact, if you do the math on all these stipulations, it came down to husbands and wives were allowed to have 44 days of sex throughout the year. I'm hoping a majority of us in here are like, ugh. Some of you are like, sign me up. <laughs> and so, so I don't want to do a poor job representing this wonderful gift that God gave us. I want the Holy Spirit to talk to us this morning. Here's what Scripture says. First time you'll probably ever see this in church. Proverbs chapter 5, 18 and 19. Let your well be honored. That's very generous terminology right there. And be happy with your wife you married when you were young. Again, I'm using the most generous terminology I can. Let her be like a loving female deer. Let her breast please you at all times. No amens on that, okay. Be filled, <laughs> be filled with great joy always because of her love. Amen. Amen. Now, let's look at the truth behind why I think churches should talk about it. First of all, we need to understand that sex is God's invention and gift designed as a celebration of union between two becoming one. That's what it's designed for, which means we need to address some of the lies that culture has kind of snuck into our mindset. We need to make sure that we're not believing cultural lies, but instead we're believing biblical truth, amen? amen. So let's talk about three lies and then we'll talk about some truth. Lie number one, sex is no big deal. It's just, you know, a physical act that, you know, we do. If you really want to, if you're really in love, that's what we do. And it's, it's really no big deal. It's just part of the relationship process. You don't need to get so tight about, you know, only having sex when you're married. The truth of the matter is God designed sex as a connection for us to be intimate physically, emotionally, and mentally. That's the truth. In 1993, y'all remember back then? 
There was a movie that had um, Woody Harrison, it had Demi Moore. Y'all, y'all remember? Y'all know where I'm going? Yeah, the movie Indecent Proposal. How many of you remember that? <laughs> Everyone else is scared to raise. <laughs> oh, no. No, pastor. I never saw that. I am holy, Lord. In this movie, spoiler, um, Robert Redford, uh, Radford, Redford, sorry. <laughs> Just looking. <laughs> sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Radford, Robert Redford. Robert Redford, uh, he's a millionaire and he makes an indecent proposal to Demi Moore's character. Now, Woody and, and, and Demi, they play a couple that are in Vegas, they're down on the luck, they need money, and he makes a proposal to Demi Moore's character saying, uh, I'll give you a million dollars if you sleep with me. So that's the plot. Now, what's interesting is, is Demi Moore's character, she makes a quote and she says this, she says, it's just my body. I'm not giving him my soul. No, I'm sorry, that's not true. There is an intimate connection that's designed to happen physically that involves your soul. In fact, can I just interrupt some of the misunderstanding possibly between your husband? That If you're here and you're like, all he wants is sex, all he talks about, all he wants from me. No, he actually wants to connect with you on a very soulish level. And the way God designed men, it happens through the physical contact. So don't ever discredit the union between your husband as it just being sex. He wants to feel valued from you. He wants to feel important from you. He wants to feel respected and desired from you. And the way that he's wired to get that answer is through sex. But it's way more than just physical. It's very emotional and it's very soulish. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 15 and 16. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scripture says, the two are united as one. Now, prostitute, we typically keep down to the noun, a person. But prostitute actually, with the adjective, simply means to treat something other than what it was desired to do to treat something differently than what it was intended for. A screwdriver was intended to simply screw in a screw. But you can prostitute a screwdriver by trying to scrape up paint with it. (laughs) Football was designed for your team to score and win, but the Dallas Cowboys prostitute the game. That's my team, and I'm hurting (laughs) y'all. Do you understand what I'm saying? Honor God with your bodies. And we prostitute our bodies when we use it in a way that's not intended for. Scripture tells us that we are body, soul, and spirit. That, That all of us in this room, let's be honest, we long for hugs, for touch, It's why we look for an intimacy to to fill the void of emotion. The Bible teaches us that sexual interactions are reserved for the covenant of marriage. That's why I want to just say with all sincerity, if you're not married, keep your hands off their soul. Line number two, the heart wants what it wants, and I just can't control my urges. Nothing interferes with logic and common sense more than the sex drive. It is a very powerful drive. Last week, Dr. Dale articulately, beautifully explained 
the thought of, of free will, how every single one of us have free will. And that life is not about just following your heart. Now, studies tell us that the thought process, when interfered with the sex drive, affects men and women very differently. Women can have up to four to five minutes of being able to make clear, conscious decisions when their sex drive kicks in. It takes about four to five minutes for the brain to move down underneath the waistline. It takes men about three seconds. <laughs> and so that's why you and I, as men, have to prepare ahead of time. Because if you're trying to decide in the moment of arousal, it's already too late. We have to be people of God to put boundaries on what we're going to expose ourselves to, boundaries on our laptop, boundaries on what we decide to watch, boundaries on how far we're going to go on a date, how far we're going to go with our mate. We have to put boundaries on those ahead of time because in the heat of the moment, while she'll be able to make conscious decisions way longer than you guys, it still gets blurred. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 3 and 5 says, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. And each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans. Now, this is very interesting that they put this in. Please understand, if you have lustful passions, it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It means you're human. When you and I gave our life to Christ, every temptation did not evaporate. Three of you are being honest. When you and I became Christians, our desires did not evaporate. Okay? But when we give in to those desires, then we start acting like what they're saying pagans, but we start acting like people who don't know Jesus, who don't know God and his ways. It's why you have to make up your mind now to be intentional because if you don't make up your mind now to set boundaries in your dating life, then you will live haphazardly. I think it's important to honor individuals that have done this because it is hard. Like I said, we all have a longing to be in a relationship, to have someone that genuinely loves us, cares for us wants to be with us. And I can't tell you the, the number of individuals that I'm aware of in dating that when this moment comes up, they cave. Their mind has already moved south. And so I think it's worth celebrating and honoring those that when the question arises, Hey, girl, are you ready to take this to the next level? We've been dating for a while, and we like each other, and, you know, we're compatible. Why don't we move this into the bedroom? And she says, then we don't need to be dating. That is difficult. That is hard. But it should be celebrated. And so I say to the young ladies in this room, that you've had to make those hard choices because I know what follows after that choice. What follows after that choice is he typically breaks it off and says, well, I'm gonna find me someone else. And you're left again in single mode. And I understand the heartache, I understand that. But please know this, God sees it too. And his blessings upon you are far greater than just your pastor saying, Awesome. Good job. We have to guard our heart. We guard our mind because it is the test of our spiritual character. Did you catch that? You might want to jot that down, type it out, tweet it out, whatever you need to do to remember it. We guard our hearts, we guard our mind because it is the test of our spiritual character towards one another and towards God. Number three, once you're married, it will solve 
all your sexual desires and difficulties. <clears throat> I'll be honest, I, I used to think this. I was a teenager in high school, and everyone was having sex. I had a couple of young ladies hit on me. Parents weren't home. Do you want to come inside? And I tried to do like Joseph, and I ran away. Good thing was I got to keep my clothes on. And so, you know, being a virgin in high school was very difficult. And growing up in church, I thought, well, when I get married, all that will wash away. Because I'll be married. And then you get married, and they're still there. The sexual desires are still there. The difficulties are still there. Why? Because it's a process. Marriage brings wonderful connection intimately, but it also brings moments where these two individuals and their complications are trying to form a relationship and move together as one. I jokingly tell Laura sometimes that, um, you know, I got married at 21 because I was preached in, the, in church that Jesus is coming back very soon, and I, I wanted to have sex before he came. <laughs> it was more than that, amen? <laughs> We're not supposed to be honest or what? <laughs> the truth is, every single one of us, if we're alive and breathing, we have some sort of difficulty that we need God to intervene in. Some of us in this room, let's just be honest enough to say that you're struggling because of an abuse that happened. Someone abused you in a wrong way and they shouldn't have. And that's your struggle. Some of us, it's loneliness. Some of us, it's, it's even sexual identity. Confusion of who you are. For a married couple, we, we need to understand this mindset that once you get married, the physical and emotional complications of sex don't magically disappear. As a married couple, you have to learn to talk these out with your spouse. In biblical days, the religious leaders, they group people into basically two classifications, good and bad. And one of the classifications that they would would lump people in is this classification of adultery. In fact, the Bible's filled with stories of these religious leaders pulling out adulter adulterous women and asking Jesus, what do we do with her? I, as a young person, I would always read that going, well, where's the guy in the story? You know? Takes two to tango. <laughs> Probably some under rug dealings, you know what I mean? Because they were using people to try to set up Jesus. And they didn't care about people. They cared about trying to get Jesus backed into a corner. And so they would, they would, they would classify these people as adulterous or good. And, and, and I know for us in, in the church, we, we kind of think that same line too. As, as married couples, we think that the goal is to get through our marriage without ever committing adultery. And so Jesus addresses this issue. And he says to us married people, listen, it's way more than that. Matthew chapter 5, 27 through 28. You have heard it, the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks upon a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his where? Heart. You know what's interesting about this and I want us to pause and recognize this. Because a few weeks ago, I was praying about what direction to take us as a church. And I felt like there were some lies that we need to uncover. And so I start mapping out what I think the Holy Spirit wants us to learn. Four months ago, we started developing the curriculum for our kids' church. Some of you may remember, almost uh, two and a half months ago, we, we had a big donut party. Because in our kids' class, they're going through the Ten Commandments. The first week, they get an overview, and then week number two, they're doing commandment number one. Love God with all your heart. Commandment number two, 
Don't have any idols before God. Commandment number three, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Commandment number four, keep the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Commandment number five, honor your father and mother. Commandment number six, thou shall not murder. Commandment number seven is today. Commandment number seven, keep your marriage vows. You must not commit adultery. I wish I was smart enough to plan that, but I'm not. That's a Holy Spirit movement. That's a moment where the Holy Spirit has orchestrated things far beyond human understanding that we need to pay attention to. Because kids in the back are learning about this right here. And we as adults are going to pick our kids up after service, and I hope we'll have some good discussions with our kids about what God wants. God wants our heart. It's why Jesus said to these religious leaders, you guys are using people. You guys are, are, are classifying people, and, and you're totally missing the point. The point is that if, if I could say it the way Jesus was intending it, he would say, you can get all self-righteous because you've not done the action, but don't kid yourself. What's in your heart? You religious leaders are trying to pull out people who are having adultery, but your very action and motive for that, your heart's wicked, more wicked than the action. Now, that's sobering to think about. It's why every single one of us, wherever we're at, what we're struggling with, let's be honest, we all carry a level of brokenness. Some of us, we, we eat our feelings. Some of us, we talk about other people. Some of us, we engage in sexual activity. Some of us are carrying past behaviors, the guilt, or maybe some of us current behaviors. Maybe some of us in this room, you're allowing your self-esteem to be defined by your sexual attracted needs. Some of us in this room, lustful thoughts or fantasizing about someone else's marriage. Maybe some of us in here are withholding from our spouse. Maybe some of us have the trauma of abuse. Every single one of us has a level of brokenness. And Jesus has come to make us whole. Jesus has come to give us life and give it to abundantly. Jesus has come that, that the questions and concerns, he can give us the answer if we'll pause long enough to ask him for him instead of what culture has been saying. Jesus is saying after, after all this to these guys, listen, what's in your heart? What's in all of us? It's why sex was designed to be centered around covenant that the two become one, and that through this process of learning each other's emotional makeup, learning each other's hurts, learning each other's desires, that, that two hearts beat as one. Two bodies operate as one. Two souls journey together as one. David we're told, had a heart after God. I mean, if, if God wants our heart, then man, we should look at David. He probably got it right all the time. This great, mighty king. I mean, David is told in scripture that his heart was after God, that God loved his heart. But when you start learning about David, you realize that David was like us. He had a lust issue. He sees a woman. When he should have been to war, he should have been in war, leading the nation, but instead he stayed back. I guarantee you this was not the very first time David saw a woman bathing on top of her place. We read the scripture and we see that David saw Bathsheba taking a bath and called for her and she came and they engaged in sexual activity and then she gets pregnant. And we think it was just bum, 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 bum. No, 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 no. I don't think that at all. I think the seed was planted months when he saw her. 
That's why he didn't go off to war where he should have been. He probably conceived in his heart, while everyone is gone, this is my moment. And it says that he took another man's wife as his own. She gave birth to, she became pregnant. And so instead of exposing this, he says, I think your husband is in the army. The war I should be fighting, you know? And so he tells the captain of the army, move him towards the front. And he has him killed in battle. This man was so dedicated that when he brought, because his first plan was, well, you're pregnant? Okay, bring the husband back home. And the husband comes home thinking that they would have relations, but his such dedication that he stayed away outside from his wife. So that didn't work. So he puts him in the front line, planned murder. This is David, the, the guy after God's own heart. So let us be very cautious that when we see an individual who has not let go of their sin, that we cast judgment. That's a great time for amen, church. We all need to be focused on the journey to be more like Jesus. And some of us need a little extra time and grace. And thank God he is the judge and not us. Because I don't know about you, but I would already be dead under man's judgment. But because of God's grace, I'm fully alive. Psalms 51, 1 through 3 says, this is David's prayer. This is David praying to God after the realization what he's done. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. David came to the conclusion that when he was faced with what he has done, to ask God for mercy, to ask God to do the healing. This morning, I don't know where you're at. I don't want to go through a list of where you might be. I just want to simply pray for you. And my prayer for you is that you would, this week, make David's prayer your prayer. Are there some things in your life that you've allowed to creep in and dictate how you live? Do some business with God this week. Pray and ask Him. Cry out to Him. He can bring you healing. He can bring you restoration. He can bring you freedom. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray for you. Welcome to Journey Church. Our church exists to help people find God, experience freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. If you have any questions about Journey Church, please visit us at OurJourney.tv. Now, let's go this week and be the church in our community as we focus on loving God and loving others. See you next week.